introduce themselves, so I'll give them that option. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Good evening. I'm Zeno Kova. This is Corey Kallenberg. Our colleague John Butterworth isn't able to make it today. But um, so we're going to be talking about, it's, this is going to be both a combination of sort of survey of a technique that I think uh, people are generally not familiar with that I think they should be familiar with. And we'll sort of cap it off showing how we've actually applied this technique in our own research. And, uh, and it's led to some pretty cool results. So uh, just by way of background, uh, we work for the MITRE Corporation. It's a nonprofit uh, company that runs uh, six federally funded research and development centers. Uh, for the U.S. government, and uh, internal to MITRE, we're just sort of fully internally funded research work. So, all right. So, per the per the title, um, you know, there's kind of a question of what exactly is it that makes attacking so sexy, right? So everyone wants to to go to the the cool and hot. You know, I found this new way to break things, and you know, that's what's valued. That's what's rewarded. But you know, if we actually think about it, like, what is it that appeals to us, right? There's there's probably some of it's you know the you know appealing to some deep-seated antisocial uh, instincts, but but I think a lot of that has to do with things like you know mental domination of your adversary and stuff like that, right? It's you're showing you know I'm smarter than you. I was able to you know break your system and so forth. I was able to do something you know you didn't realize that this was possible, but I was able to do it. So there's things that I know that you don't know, and that means I win. Right? But, but those are the kind of things that potentially can be used by defenders as well, and that can lead to uh, um, you know, happiness and satisfaction in the defender world when you're you know, watching the, the attackers you know, pointlessly bang their heads against the door. But, uh, but yeah, there's, there's all these sort of things that are listed on the slide, including risk, because risk is good. Um, and so we're going to kind of go through this technique, which, like I said, I don't think a lot of people know. It's, it's very much an academic technique. It's something where people said, oh, there's this weird little way I can do this thing. But, um, but like I said, it's, it's something that people should be aware of because it, it's very interesting, basically. You know, we think it's very cool, and, and uh, it utilizes a lot of the things that we think uh, makes attacking generally sexy to people. So we're going we're gonna to talk about what exactly that is. This, like I said, this is going to be starting with a survey explaining uh, all this other work, you know, so that you don't have to go out and read, you know, 30 different academic research papers, which takes a while. And then uh, we'll kind of cap it off with some work we've done in the Windows kernel and in BIOSes. So I don't know if this animation is going to work, but I made a nice little, uh, oh, it's super slow, but yeah, there's our little animation of if you go to that link, you'll find a little timeline of the different work that's been uh, made in this area. And there's a few attack papers. It's mostly defensive papers and mostly applying this technique to a bunch of different uh, types of technologies, applying it to a bunch of different uh, platforms and so forth. Basically, people showing, you know, hey, this does work. So the title of the talk, Timing-Based Data Station. What is Timing-Based Data Station? So, uh, at the simplest form, we consider it a way of saying that the, the folk wisdom, let's call it that, because it's nothing more than that, the folk wisdom in computer security is that an attacker and offender at the equivalent privilege level, the de defender always loses. The attacker always has you know, potential for first mover advantage. The attacker is always able to mess with the defender's software, analyze the defender's software, come in and you know, only attack when he's ready to attack, when he knows that he can breach the defenses, right? So obviously the defender can never actually win if you've got security software in the kernel, you've got an attacker in the kernel, kernel must, you know, kernel attacker must de facto be the winner of that battle, right? So our point is uh, you can have defensive software which is at the same privilege level as all metrics, but uh, a metrics that we're going to care about uh, sort of uh, code integrity and saying something about this software is not actually manipulated at the time it runs. This code is intact. This code is, uh, has full integrity. That's the property that we're going to care about for the purpose of this talk. So obviously there's other properties you can care about, you know, confidentiality, but uh, we're, we're focusing specifically on integrity. So another way that I like to describe the technique is that you're specifically, well, what the technique boils down to is that you're trying to build your software in a very special manner so that 
you're trying to funnel the attacker so that he goes after your software, but if he goes after your software, if he tries to manipulate it so that uh, the code is not intact and it's you know, able to lie about what's going on in the system, that the code will actually run slower. So that's how you sort of measure the notion of whether or not your system is currently under attack. It has to do with the timing of the execution. And that's, so we say, if the code has its integrity, it'll run in a certain amount of time. If the code does not have integrity, it'll run in a slower amount of time. And another way this can kind of be thought of is taking a technique like uh, timing side channel analysis, which is very often used exclusively for attackers. You're saying like, I know how your RSA implementation works. I can watch that it takes more time when it's fed this input versus that input. So typically software has these sort of data dependent implicit timing, uh, timing constraints or, or timing variations. So attackers have leveraged the fact that your software will kind of accidentally take more time to do one thing from another in order to the attacker can detect what it's doing and then the attacker can, for instance, extract keys from encryption algorithms. In our use case, we're trying to specifically build the software so that we guarantee that if someone's messing with it, it'll run slower. We're, we're trying to build it in a way that we expect it'll, it'll take more time to run in the presence of an attacker. Because the assumption is we're at the same privilege level as the attacker, the attacker can do whatever they want, and they're going to be manipulating us, we just want to be able to detect that. So one way to sort of view this is, um, is in this sort of uh, challenge response sort of protocol. This is how a lot of the, the academic work ends up looking. You'll have some server somewhere that is implicitly trusted. It's going to communicate to the client. The client is the thing where we're trying to actually uh, determine the integrity of the client. We're saying, okay, you've got a, you know, I think some of the original work, they were using PDAs and stuff like that. You've got a PDA and you want to know whether an attacker is actually attacking it. So nowadays you've got a smartphone. Uh, but you've got some device and you want to know if the attacker is manipulating the device, whether it's making the device lie. So you send a challenge to it, so you've got a nice fresh nonce, and the result that it calculates by checking its own code will depend on that nonce, and it'll send it back. And based on, it becomes a very hardware-specific sort of problem. So you say, I know what hardware exists on that client. I know it's an you know, iPhone running at 600 megahertz, and it has this processor and this cache architecture and everything else. So it gets a bit, you know, for software people, it gets a bit nitty gritty in that you have to know things about the hardware and you have to be able to profile information about the hardware. But when you have those assumptions, then you can start saying, based on this hardware, it should take this amount of time to run my algorithm. It's gonna feed me out a result that says, my code has this measurement for itself and it should take X amount of time. And so what we want to see, what we're trying to force, is we're saying in the presence of an attacker, they can make the software lie because that's the sort of win condition that the attackers are able to utilize right now. They're able to, you know, you rootkit a system, the rootkit says there is no attacker there, right? They're lying about the state of the system. Um, and so we're saying in the presence of that type of attacker who's trying to force software to lie, trying to, to make it execute different code but still give the right result, they'll succeed in their first order challenge of forging the result but they won't be able to succeed in the second order challenge of forging the amount of time it takes to calculate the result because you know, they have to add extra instructions, extra instructions equals extra time. And then that, that gets into the whole issue of how do you construct it to force it to take extra time. All right, so backing up a little bit, we call it timing-based attestation. The majority of the academic work calls it uh, software-based attestation. Uh, the reason we sort of call we think timing-based attestation is just a, a nice, better, superset sort of term saying what we're really getting at is not, there's nothing like that has to be software specific about it. You can use hardware if you have hardware available. We've used TPMs to do sort of trustworthy timing and things like that. Or technique of make the code run at a different amount of time, it's all about time. So we use this sort of superset super uh, terminology, but if you want to you know, look up the academic work, you'll see most of it's called software-based attestation. Or if you don't want to use a nice stodgy academic term, we like chronomancy because that sounds cooler and then you have to at least explain that to people and they say, what, what are you talking about chronomancy? Then you at least get the conversation started, right? So our, our latest work is BIOS chronomancy. It's applying this, uh, this technique down to customized BIOSes where you assume there's an attacker already in the BIOS and we're going to have our defender there as well and, and detect them. So I said that what we're kind of trying to do is, you know, 
we're jumping right to this sort of low level, like you've got to profile the hardware and you've got to know how long it takes the algorithms to run and stuff like that. But the question is, why would the attacker ever bother attacking you in the first place? You have to have some constraints and assumptions of why the attacker would bother to attack you. And so the way we see this sort of logic going is, you know, it has to be a foundational component of a, you know, it would be a root of trust functionally. It's a foundational component of a overall system where this is where the trust is derived. The attacker doesn't want to trust, the attacker doesn't want to attack your code for the fun of it. He's got some other goal that he wants to do. He wants to, you know, steal bitcoins off the system or something like that, right? But he wants to go after a bitcoin wallet and the bitcoin wallet is actually protected by some operating system security. So he says, I need to subvert the operating system first and then I win and I can, you know, I can go steal the coins out of the wallet. But then, you know, if your operating system is, is properly constructed, right, there should have to be some further security you have to subvert to subvert the operating system security. That's why, you know, Microsoft's added things like code signing and you've got uh, a patch guard and stuff like that trying to prevent manipulation of kernel memory. So we're kind of trying to make the attacker, you know, this is under the assumption that you've got all these other things. So you've got an operating system that can protect processes. You've got security that protects the operating system. And, and then this is the type of thing that protects the security that protects the operating system. So the way that kind of looks, like I said, we're down at sort of the foundational level. The attacker wants to attack something up here, but presumably it's protected by the thing below it, so they go after the thing below it, which is protected by the thing below it, so they go after the thing below it, which is protected by us down at the bottom, so they go after us. But then our thing, you know, unlike so many other things, is built under the assumption that they're going after us and that they have the full privileges to manipulate us as they see fit, and uh, consequently, uh, we're going to be able to detect that. So this is just the sort of typical um, measurement and attestation story of we're going to have to have some root that does some measurements. In, measure, in, in our case, our specific case, we're doing a measurement over ourselves. That, that's what this special construction is going to be all about. We measure ourselves and then we measure the security software so that we have some evidence that we're either untampered or we're, we know we're tampered with, but we know it because the time's different. And then we know something about the security software and security software knows something about the OS and the OS knows something about the operating uh, the applications. So, uh, getting to the assumptions that I kind of mentioned before, you know, there's a few of them. Um, on the plus side of things, as defenders, we're making a very, you know, strong assumption about the attacker that he has full control of the system. He's at the same privilege level as us. He can, you know, build his code, abut it right up next to us in memory, manipulate us however he wants. All his goal is is to sort of try to lie about our code and lie about the amount of time it takes. One of the other assumptions is that when we go out and build this software that's supposed to have this, uh, this deterministic amount of time that it runs in and this time optimal amount of time that it runs in, it has to be the fastest way that you can possibly implement this algorithm. Because if the attacker can in and write a faster way to do this algorithm, then he's going to win because he adds a couple of instructions to lie, but then he subtracts a couple of instructions from the algorithm net zero time increase, right? So the assumption has to be that we're time optimal. And honestly, this is one of the biggest unproven assumptions in all of this literature. The way that we and all the other, you know, academics get around this is we say, well, we guess and tested it. We wrote our algorithm, we went there and we like, you know, changed stuff up, we added an instruction here. Like, so we have our algorithm where we say, this is the algorithm. Let's add an instruction here. Does the algorithm take more time? Yes, good, okay. Let's add an instruction here. Does the algorithm take more time? No, like there apparently the microarchitecture had an extra ALU and they could add another add instruction for no time overhead. So you basically have to kind of uh, do a lot of testing. It's all sort of down at this level, it's all hand coded assembly and uh, manipulation of it directly. But that's again part of the reason why we think this is, you know, sexy lead stuff because, you know, People can write their, their special custom shell code and we can write our special time optimal architecture specific, you know, understanding of the full hardware that's going on in the system. We can write that type of code and say something that we believe that this is the best way you can implement this algorithm and the attackers aren't able to go faster. Um, another of the assumptions, like I kind of said, just that you have to be able to baseline the hardware. It has to, you have to be building an algorithm that's deterministic in the first place so you can say, that is how much time it should take. It should take no longer. So, so that's not that big of an assumption. 
because you've got, well, okay, that's not that big of an assumption, but then, you know, there's a little bit of, of finagling things that's sometimes necessary. So in the early days when we started experimenting with this, we ran up against the type of things you'd expect where, for instance, um, on laptops that are not plugged into the uh, into power, you know, the, the operating system is going to cycle down the processor to save power, right? So if they've just cycled the processor to 50% of its maximum CPU frequency, then obviously this thing is going to take way longer to run, right? So we have to play little games to like make sure that we're running at maximum processor frequency and, uh, and that type of thing. So. But still, you know, just for the duration of the run, we kick up the CPU frequency, we lock out every other code, we, you know, stop OS scheduling and stuff like that. So we're the only one running, we're running at max frequency, and then it should take a fixed amount of time. And then, as I just sort of mentioned, that kind of, this last thing, no free execution slots. You have to understand how the actual microarchitecture works because otherwise the attacker could get, they could add extra instructions to uh, compensate for their timing and they might not actually lead to any overhead. All right, so now this is probably one of the most dry slides in the entire thing, but I have to give you just a sense of like what's encompassed in, in the thing before I go to some nice C pseudocode. So everything's hand-coded assembly. This is gonna be some pseudocode to explain like the basic integration of things into these algorithms. So these algorithms are really pretty simple and you can play little games and incorporate more stuff beyond this, but the question is what is the core stuff that we think is actually necessary to incorporate into these special software constructions? All right, the first thing is um, pseudo-random number. So that has to do with this nonce, this challenge that comes from the server. And uh, if you think about it, obviously, if you didn't have some randomness inherent in this, then if it was always, you know, dear software, are you corrupt? Give me a measurement of yourself. And there's a fixed measurement. Simple attack by the attacker, replay attack. He just goes ahead and says, yep, here's the clean value. And the problem is, you go look at most security software in the wild and that's about as complicated as things get if you wanna, if you wanna lie about whether or not the software is good. So we need to picture this like the simple 32-bit assembly, picture a 32-bit nonce, right? So that means, okay, there's only four billion possible challenges and responses, right? So if an attacker wants to pre-compute all the possible challenges and responses, now he needs to store four billion four byte values so that he can just do a table lookup, right? The problem is that starts becoming you know, expensive for him. He has to have so much RAM in order to do it. Well, the obvious easy, you know, even if he can store that much RAM in the first place, you know, he's not doing it on laptops, but maybe on a server system he is doing it, right? It's a very simple problem to get around. You just 128-bit number, you know, 64-bit number, whatever is easy for the architecture. And then now it becomes prohibitively expensive in terms of RAM for the attacker to pre-compute, like, I asked you for a measurement of yourself, and you can't just look it up. You have to compute it on the fly. So that's the first thing. Force them to compute it live. Do it live. So pseudo-random numbers stops replay attacks, stops pre-compute computation attacks. All right, the next thing, obviously, you're going to be reading your own code and data, that should say code and data. So if I'm asking you whether your code is intact, you need to read your code and give me some, you know, determination that your code has not been manipulated. So you're basically kind of checksumming your own code, but again, it's not a fixed, it's not a fixed checksum, it's a checksum as a function of a nonce, so it's gonna differ every time. So the key point here is if they're doing a rootkit type attack where they're doing an inline hook and they're putting a jump instruction in your code so that you're about to read some data and they put a jump instruction there and they're gonna jump off and they're going to you know, incorporate the clean data and then they're gonna jump back, that jump instruction will be read while you're reading your own code that will lead to the wrong checksum, right? So any sort of inline changes to the code integrity will be detected through that. Wait, did I just misexplain this? Why? Okay. Yes, no. The next thing, I'm wording it a little weird here, read your instruction pointer and your data pointer. All right, so this is a sort of, this is probably the hardest thing to grasp, but it's very essential to the thing. You need to have some expectation about where your code is running in memory. Because one of the first order attacks that someone will do against this is they, I say, dear software, read your own memory and confirm that it's unmanipulated. The first thing an attacker might do is Instead, they're going to read a clean copy of that memory. So there's these clean copy attacks that are going to take place. 
If they just read a clean copy, the clean copy will check some correctly, they'll you know, provide back. So what you do is you incorporate the expectation about where your instructions should be executing. So that should be generally in the same range as your data itself. So you're reading from yourself and you're executing from yourself. You're incorporating those pointers into the checksum. So that if an attacker is executing off somewhere else and reading your original, that'll be wrong because the instruction pointer will be right. If the attacker is executing in the right place but reading the wrong data, that'll be wrong because the data pointer will be wrong. So those are sort of things where you have to be, you know, best case is you have some expectation about where your code actually is in memory. In our Windows work, we actually found because in kernel, even pre-ASLR, WinVista and things like that, even back in WinXP, the kernel didn't respect um, uh, asked for base addresses of kernel modules. Even XP will just load the kernel module wherever it feels like it. So that was kind of a faux ASLR. We couldn't have expectations about where we were going to be running. We had to compensate for that. It, on XP, or on Windows rather, where you have ASLR, it means that basically uh, an attacker gets a free sort of forgery. We don't know where the data necessarily will be, and that allows them to get one of those two things forged for free. All right. And then I have a, like a catch-all thing here saying there's going to be other ways that the attacker can potentially manipulate your code uh, uh, while it's running. So they can use, for instance, you know, breakpoints, instruction. Uh, they can use hardware breakpoints. They can use uh, manipulation of interrupts and things like that. So for anything that could potentially lead to sort of divergence, easy divergence of your control flow. So you're supposed to be just running your code. It's supposed to be reading your data. If the attacker can like bounce off to somewhere else and execute his stuff and then bounce back, you know, first of all, that's probably going to add extra instructions. But to kind of take it off the table, what you want to do is you want to find those ways that he can jump elsewhere. You want to set them to some pseudo random value, and you want to incorporate those as well. So this is kind of a catch-all. It covers a bunch of things that are you know too detailed for me to get into here. But the last point is the most important point. The important point about this special software construction is that you have to be doing it in this looping fashion where you're reading all of your instructions, you're reading all of your code and data, but you're doing it millions and millions of times. So you're picking one you know, four byte chunk of your code and you're reading that. And then you're picking another one at random and you're reading that and then you're picking another one at random. You do this millions of times and if the attacker has you know, modified your code, again, we're trying to go for code integrity, if they've modified your code, then they're going to I'm taking way long to explain this, sorry. But if they've modified your code, then they're going to have to do this modification millions of times for each of these millions of loops. So to um, the sort of C pseudocode view of this, the simplest possible way is you have this while loop. You, we're putting two and a half million iterations here because that's what's been used in some academic papers. And you've got this checksum of yourself. You incorporate the nonce. You do plus the nonce, and then you do XOR, the data pointer itself, and then you dereference the data pointer. So you grab some actual data that points at your own code. You grab that, incorporate that. You incorporate the instruction pointer. You mix it up so that you have some diffusion. Um, and then uh, you get a new nonce, and you calculate a new random data pointer so that you're basically bouncing around at random. The reason you do these sort of random jumps of grabbing your stuff is because if, if you just were doing sort of linear jumps, and you of, um, of constant data, like maybe you have a bunch of zeros or maybe you have a bunch of Fs or something like that, the attacker could get a benefit by like, you know, you're scanning down linearly, you come to a bunch of Fs, they know like, you know, the computation of the incorporation of all those Fs, they could steal some time back by just saying, okay, I know what all those are going to be. But when you start bouncing around at random, they can't like expect that there's going to be a big region of constants that they can compensate for. So this is sort of the essence of uh, you know, what an, a code integrity attack on this sort of software would look like. It's saying, you know, if the data pointer currently points to my attacker code, my hook location, I'm going to go off and read a copy of the clean bytes, okay? If it does not point at my attacker code, I'm just going to read whatever bytes are there. And so this is how he tries to hide his presence inside the software, manipulating the software. And this sort of algorithm will lead to the correct checksum the checksum will incorporate the clean bytes. The checksum will be correct. But by virtue of having an if instruction in there, the if instruction turns into a couple assembly instructions. A couple of assembly instructions times millions of loops equals millions of assembly instructions equals some larger amount of time. So, so that's really what this is about. Going back to this picture, it should take a fixed amount of time, delta t, and in the presence of an attacker, a couple of instructions for an if uh, times millions of loops equals uh, millions of overhead. 
And there's some other miscellaneous things that I had to, so I had a full section here on, on different attacks, uh, but unfortunately I had to remove it due to time constraints. So there's a whole bunch of other attacks, maybe you'll come up with some of them in the uh, questions section, hopefully I'll have the answer for it already. But, but let's, uh, let's get into like the quick survey of what some of the existing work in this area looks like. So the first one that I consider of this, this particular breed of uh, self-integrity check was a paper out of Purdue called Establishing the Genuinity of Remote Computer Systems. And they introduced this notion of random bouncing around and so forth. Um, and basically, as I said, the key point was they were trying to get a verification of the software by doing a measurement over the software. And they incorporated a lot of very interesting sort of memory hierarchy side effects. So they were trying to sort of exploit the fact that an attacker adding extra instructions or going and reading from different data than you would normally read, it can lead to lots of interesting side effects on the CPU microarchitecture, such as misses in caches and things like that. And those can be very powerful things to exploit. <clears throat> So their original checksum was, you know, very super simple. It was just summing up and, and XORing. They had this plus XOR construction and later on work sort of um, established that doing, the reason all of this sort of work will tend to do an add and an XOR and add and an XOR is because this is what uh, one of the future papers pioneer called a strongly ordered function. And the point here is that an attacker cannot parallelize these things. Like maybe some of you are thinking, well, I'm just gonna go do this on a GPU and GPUs are fast at doing stuff, right? Parallelizing things and running it across many cores. But these algorithms are inherently non-parallelizable because if you have A plus B, XOR C plus D, XOR E, and so forth, that's the kind of computation where when it's done in a sort of left to right fashion, you come up with one result. If you try to break that up and like compute all the XORs together and then add those all together, you're gonna get a different result than if you would have just you know, done it in a left to right order of operations. So this leads to sort of an inherent uh, non-parallelizable notion. Um, they were doing their uh, measurement over the network. So these systems will, you'll typically see they tend to either go over the network where they're timing it over the network and that's what we did with some of our work or they'll you know, try to, understandably, right, there's gonna be jitter over the network and things like that. So sometimes they'll make the assumption that, well, it's more something that you plug in a USB cord or a USB key or something like that. So this particular architecture, you know, we're gonna just kind of show that this has been applied to a different, bunch of different places. It was done on a PC. <clears throat> it was done on x86. It was a plain Pentium. And I'm highlighting that it's a von Neumann architecture because we're going to see it on Harvard architectures elsewhere. Uh, it covered 16 uh, megabytes of memory and the attestation channel was the, the network. All right, so then someone, uh, someone wrote an attack paper against that saying like, oh man, you can't use these side effects to establish this. We can do this sort of attack. And that was all just like silliness where they're saying, we could beat this. And then the people wrote a response paper and they said, no, you guys don't know the architecture as well as us. And you didn't write your thing correctly. And they did a nice little back and forth. But, uh, but honestly, given the architectural details that the, the original authors cited versus these, so it was, it was Purdue versus Berkeley and the Purdue people won in my mind because they understood the architecture much better than the Berkeley people cited. Next major thing, so that first one, genu genuinity, that's a PC thing. SWAT, this was the basis of a bunch of other things. Uh, Software-based attestation for embedded systems. This was uh, Berkeley Micromotes. These were, you know, they were trying to get smart dust and stuff, and they had these tiny little, you know, not so tiny little embedded systems where there are little wireless sensor nodes and things like that. But, but that was a, a Admel at Mega system. They were just taking the Genuinity system, porting it to that, making a couple of little tweaks. Um, and this was out of CMU. And that was applied to an 8-bit RISC architecture and Harvard architecture system. So they actually, the interesting thing here, when you're dealing with embedded systems, right, you probably can measure all of memory. It's not necessarily just that you're like checking your own software. You can get away with measuring all of memory in these sort of memory constrained systems. So you can get a much stronger attestation property to say, I've confirmed that my software is right and all of the other operating system software is in a state I expect. This will show up sort of later when some people kind of ported this notion to phones like Android phones. But you know, Android phones quickly move towards PC type things and we don't think on PCs it's practical to do this for all of memory once you start getting into you know four gigs worth of memory and so forth. It starts taking too long, right? But anyways, 
just another way of looking at sort of the notion of the attacker takes longer to run. They took you know, some amount of memory and when they had the presence of an attacker, the attacker always had this sort of like extra delta on top. And this, I guess the interesting thing about putting this in here is that the important thing to understand about these techniques is we're trying to get the attacker just to add a couple of instructions over overhead, right? And that's probably not that much overhead, but it's more about the percentage overhead that it is. If it's, even if it's a small percentage, when you start increasing the amount of runs that you're willing to do, you increase the number of iterations, small percentage times large magnitude still equals, you know, large magnitude. So if you run stuff longer, basically, that just makes it that much easier to detect stuff. And um, yeah, so then the SWAT people said that they applied it to cars and they were totally lying. I'm just putting that out there. I thought it was super cool. I saw this paper saying, oh, we applied SWAT to cars. No, they didn't. Um, but then it was used on other sort of wireless sensors. Uh, this was one that, uh, I think this was out of University of Minnesota. I think this was one of my previous professors. It was lame because it was only a protocol specification. They didn't actually implement anything. So when you're doing this stuff, implement stuff. Um, this was then an attack paper saying, okay, well, we have this generic attack on these things in that we can play games with the, uh, the memory architecture. We can say, all right, well, the page tables may be looking like this, the virtual memory mapping may be looking like this at the time that you run, and you're going to check this code, and it's all going to say it's all clean, but then immediately once you're done running, I'm going to go make it dirty again. And so this is something where we think that this wasn't adequately dealt with in the research, and it's still kind of an open issue, but this notion, this is sort of the, the strongest type of attack on these systems is a talk to attack, time of check, time of use. So I can run and I can tell you that this code is intact and nobody's messed with it, but what about 10 seconds later, right? Unfortunately, the reality of the situation is that this is true for basically all sort of security systems, right? You know, your antivirus ran a scan on your hard drive right now and what about 10 seconds later, right? but it becomes more of an issue. We care about it more because it becomes one of the few sort of legitimate attacks against this, whereas you know, antivirus has many other ways before you would ever have to do a talk to attack. There's so many other ways to beat it, but we start caring about talk to because it's one of the main ways to beat these systems. All right, and so Pioneer is what, um, what, the, um, what the kernel, so this was, um, as it says, Linux PC based thing. Um, this is what we used to, we sort of, Conceptually, we ported Pioneer to Windows kernel. It was a Linux kernel type thing. Um, and our, imp well, I don't want to jump the gun on our work, but this work was basically saying, we can confirm that over the network, one hop over the network, like uh, it's a little ambiguous in the paper, but I believe they're saying through one switch. So I've got laptop here, switch, laptop there. I can do this measurement over the network and I can confirm, I can definitely see that th there's the presence of an attacker on this system. And they were running with newer hardware, 64-bit system. Uh, they, one of the constraining things there is that, and this is what we overcame for our work, is you know, they're Linux, they can build it directly into the kernel module that talks to the network card. So that's like one way that they can eliminate jitter that we weren't able to you know, with proprietary uh, network drivers on Windows. And they were doing the attestation over the network. Uh, nice thing about their work is they put their, their source code open for you know, analysis and so forth, as have we. And, but this is sort of the, the protocol and the, the picture of the way that this system and our system and related systems are built. You've got this batcher, that's the server side. You've got the untrusted platform, that's the client side. You've got a verification function which is on both sides. So I haven't really talked about this element yet, but, excuse me, <coughs> you've got the verifier, the server side has to somehow be able to recompute the same result that the client generated, right? The verifier has to say like, here's a new nonce go calculate a measurement of yourself. But it needs to know what the good measurement is, right? So it has to be able to compute that same algorithm on its side. It's just the verifier has the luxury that it can compute it slower. It doesn't need to do it fast. It can do it slower and still just get the right result. So basically, the nonce challenge comes over. The checksum measures itself. It measures the send function. It measures the hash function. The hash function can hash arbitrary code then. But you have some, some verification that that hash function is untampered with. And then, uh, and then you send back the checksum and you send back the hash. And that's basically the same way our stuff works. Here's a little picture of their, the results. They're kind of saying, you know, there's an expected runtime. There's an expected threshold, like a best case attacker. The, uh, here's the actual attacker runtime, a little bit of jitter in there. Um, this PRISM one was kind of interesting in that 
you know, these are all sort of server client things. They lend themselves to sort of enterprise architectures. They're not exactly like home user things. You're not going to use it on, uh, you know, securing grandma's computer and stuff like that, unless you start using something more like this. Here they're doing this timing-based system, but instead of like attesting to an actual computer, they're attesting to a human. So they can say like, you type in your challenge, you give a nonce, and you've got this pre-printed card that says, okay, well for this nonce you should get back this result and it should take you know, X seconds on this computer. So this has to do with that thing I was saying where if you run it for many more loops, it'll take longer, the attacker will have a larger, you know, absolute time, you know, 1% of 10 seconds, you know, you're going to have a larger time that potentially the human is actually able to determine that, um, that there is something going on, right? The human is actually put in the loop to say, all right, I'm going to type it in. If I don't see this thing print out the correct value within, you know, 10 seconds or 5 seconds or what have you, if it takes longer than 5 seconds, then I know that this code is not intact and I shouldn't trust this. So that was an interesting implementation because it was done on a sharp Zaris PDA that was one of the Linux PDAs that people like to play with. And that was uh, an X-scale Intel ARM uh, processor and uh, again, von Neumann architecture. Uh, this was actually applied to SCADA systems and RTUs specifically. And so this was again the CMU work, the CMU group, they applied it to VXWorks, SCADA pack, and it was running on ARM systems. So this is just saying, at some point basically they started just saying like, look, we're saying this works on embedded systems. Here's another embedded system, it works there, it works here, it works there, and they're just kind to, you know, trying to convince people that it works in different areas. Um, and this was one that will, that uh, Corey will talk about in a little bit. This was something that they didn't implement it, we ended up implementing it, but this is where we got this notion of timing-based attestation versus, you know, just quote-unquote software-based attestation. These previous things, part of their justification was saying like, oh, we assume you don't have any trusted hardware, so you're just going to run software and that's going to build up your trust. This was interesting in that it applied the timing-based protocol to um, the use of the TPM can actually be used to provide some timing as well. The TPM has a little tick counter, just like your normal CPU has a tick counter, but the difference is when you run the RDTSC instruction on x86, you get a tick stamp back, but there's no, you have no way of knowing if someone lied about that, right? Someone could just like write a different tick stamp into your code after manipulating your code. With the TPM, it's got this little tick stamp that it keeps updating as it's running, but you can actually get that digitally signed by the TPM uh, with the key that's internal to the TPM that's a private key that's inside the TPM that's never exported. So if this was our network-based attestation system, uh, this is our TPM attestation system. The server sends a nonce to the client. The client then requests a tick stamp from the TPM, which is just tell me how many ticks you've got right now and give me a digital signature of that as well. And it sends back the signature and the, the tick count. That's used as the actual nonce for the self-check so that you know that it has to be a function of this, uh, this TPM status at a particular time. And then, uh, and then you just compute it and you have an expected amount of time. You send back all the data for the server to verify that this is the right data. Now, this is the reason that implementing papers is important and why you shouldn't believe anybody who doesn't implement their paper, right? They outlined a protocol that said, oh, we can totally just apply Pioneer to TPMs and that'll be working. Well, this was uh, 18, oh, 32 different systems. Uh, each of them actually, their TPMs took a different amount of time to run, like the checksum was taking a certain amount of time, but their TPM ticks were uh, skewed significantly. And you can see there's this one that's like crazy skewed. That's the one that we think we actually probably broke from like overuse when we were like testing the system. We were just like using the TPM so much that was like our test system and then we applied it to all 32. And we're pretty sure we just broke that. But even still, you can see that even within this, even although each thing has an independent thing, you can still see when the attacker is present. Low value to start with, we dynamically insert the attacker who's able to forge the, the, you know, he's able to forge the checksum, but he's not able to forge the time. So it increases the amount of time, and then we take the attacker away and it decreases the amount of time. So technically you could like baseline that system should have that amount of time for its TPM and so forth, but that leads to, you know, some problems of practicality. So we'll see later that different TPMs behave differently, but, but that was one of the big results of that. Uh, then finally there was, well not quite finally, there was um, an attack paper which was basically 
again, some people tried to independently uh, generate their own uh, timing-based attestation system. They said, well, I'm actually able to defeat these other systems, in this case because they used ROP return-oriented programming. And, um, but in reality, we think that this is just another case where they're using ROP, but what they're really doing is they're letting, they're using ROP in order to gain control flow. They're saying, a measurement's about to start, I'm going to use ROP, get control, remove all the changes from the code, let the code run, and then whenever it's done, I'm going to come back and insert the changes again. So that's, again, it's a talk to attack. The measurement, the time of check, does not equal the time of use, and this is just a fundamental sort of problem that, that still needs additional stuff. Um, also, there was another attack inside there that was super stupid because basically they said, well, this incurs a delay that could be detected by a verifier, and then it's like, I don't know how that got through, I don't know how that got into Usenix or wherever it got, but I won't say anything about Usenix. All right. SBAP was actually very cool because 2009, there's, an, uh, there's a talk at Black Hat where they basically were reverse engineering uh, the keyboard controller inside an Apple USB keyboard. And so he said, like, here's an exercise. I went in, I analyzed how the keyboard controller worked, and I inserted a keylogger into the keyboard itself by modifying the firmware for the keyboard. What uh, the CMU people then did is they came along and said, oh, you know how to write code into the keyboard controller? We're going to write timing-based attestation code into the keyboard controller so that the next time you know, someone tries to modify that, we'll have you know, a, a verification of it. So that was kind of interesting. You know, it, was another, uh, it was another random uh, architecture, Cypress and Encore and so forth. Again, more of a, a slow system, uh, uh, embedded type system. But, uh, but that was sort of an interesting thing where when an attacker finds a hole, they find their way into the system, that just sort of opens up an opportunity for the defender that we now know how to write code there, we know how to write code there that is able to detect you because we're at the same privilege level. And then um, this one is actually where some people are actually trying to commercialize this. So uh, retroactive detection for malware, a company called Fat Skunk, they're basically just trying to take the SWAT work and apply it to Android phones. They're saying, all right, we have seen this work out there. We think we can apply it to phones. They say they can apply it to phones. They haven't like, actually published the accurate like, results or data that sort of indicates it. But assuming we believe them, this means that, again, this technology has uh, been shown to work on you know, an Android G1 600 megahertz ARM system. Um, I just lost my mind. These words aren't making any sense. Okay. <laughs> All right. Blanked out there for a second. This was just, there's, this was um, uh, in Asia CCS, I think. There was another one where they were saying they applied it to. No, I, went. I think that's a copy and paste error. I'm pretty sure this was on a PC, not an Android phone. But they just said that, okay, look, these timing based attestation systems are great, but. What about these multi-core systems? People haven't dealt with this explicitly. Can't I still have, you know, attacker code running off on this other core? And, you know, this core just measured itself and measured its RAM, but what about the other core? Can that guy be, you know, throwing in attacks against the RAM of the other core? And the answer is yes, and so they provided a design system in order to, you know, get all of the cores involved and uh, make it so that they're all able to sort of establish the, the genuinity of their system as well as they had another talk to attack, which is why we have this recurring theme that we think you know, people need to start combating them. And then I think this is the finally, before we kick it over to Corey and talk about uh, some of our work, uh, verification of the integrity of peripherals. This was pretty interesting because they were trying to deal with the problem of, okay, you have CPU verification, but what about the fact that we know that there's all sorts of hacker talks on, you know, I can break into this NIC and now I have, you know, uh, I'm actually running in the firmware on the NIC completely independent from the CPU. I'm running on the firmware on the hard drive completely independent from the CPU. I would like to be able to go out and measure those firmwares for the peripherals and know that there's not an attacker there. And the reality of the situation is today we have like absolutely zero way to go out and do that. Um, you know, like some of our other work is working on, you know, first level stuff like the BIOS, but, you know, there's nothing out there to, to know whether or not your hard drive is infected or your, uh, like your actual hard drive proper is infected. And there's been increasing amounts of work on that. So what they had actually done back in 2011 is they, they took, again, some attacker work from conferences. Um, there was an attack on NIC cards where they said, I can run on the NIC independently. I can steal all your packets. I can communicate with my malware. It can you know, steal all of your RAM through DMA and so forth. 
Um, they took that attack and then they built timing-based data station into the NIC. But beyond that, there was the question of, okay, you want to verify that your NIC card is not currently infected. You ask the NIC card, are you infected? It's supposed to compute the thing. But what if that NIC card can proxy it off to something that's faster? So the NIC card doesn't do the computation on the slow NIC card. It passes it off to the CPU or the GPU or some other faster processor, which is able to compute this checksum much faster than it would be able to. So it's still able to compute it in this delta T amount of time. So yeah, Netgear card, it MIPS architecture, 200 megahertz. <coughs> So they come up with an interesting modification of these existing algorithms. The existing algorithms, you send a challenge, you do two and a half million iterations, and then you send the result back. They came up with instead, I'm going to do one small slice of part of the code. I'm not going to verify all the code all at once. I'm going to do a little slice of the code, and then I'm going to send the result back. And so going back to our sort of view of the world, OK, so if we have a proxy attack in place, if this is the delta t, this compromised client can just proxy it off to a faster client who's able to compute the checksum like way faster, and the attack, the client is able to send the result back faster. There's some latency inherent in this sending of the results. So we understand that like there's this certain amount of latency if you had like an infinitely fast computation on this other proxy to host, you would still have some latency in communication, and that's what they're actually exploiting. They're exploiting this intra-computer, because we're talking about like latencies over PCI buses and stuff like this. But the key point is basically compute a checksum over less stuff so that the overhead of the latency is actually more than uh, the delta T. So you're basically making it so that if the attacker were to try to send it somewhere else and send it back, even if they did absolutely zero computation or if they were infinitely fast, it would still take too long for them to get the result back based on the constraint of how much time it needs to take. So that's a pretty interesting thing. We're hoping to adapt this to the sort of PC world eventually, see whether it works over Ethernet or not. But, but now finally, uh, we'll get into some of our work, like I said, porting things, and I'll, uh, I'll let Corey talk about that. OK, so um, as Zeno was pointing out, many of these things were done on uh, not so much enterprise operating systems, but enterprise architecture. So we actually wanted to do that in an enterprise environment, our own, with uh, thousands of computers, and also across uh, multiple hops and so forth and so on. Uh, so some of the main results from our attempt to do this was that, one, we can't actually do this on enterprise-grade operating systems like Windows and enterprise-grade enterprise -grade environments. Uh, we can use the TPM, in some cases, as a, tr as a trusted timer to uh, do this across the internet and you know the VPNs and things like that. When the, uh, there's many many hops where it would add too much jitter, and uh, we can all just we can do this all from like a kernel driver in Windows, and that still talk to is a big problem that is not being sufficiently dealt with. Um, so this was our uh, our architecture basically. There's you know there was many hops, and what we did was we put our clients all across our network, so that one would be one hop away, all the way to different buildings with several hops in between them. And we wanted to gather a bunch of empirical data, so we ran thousands of self-attestations. And our, our graph looks something like this. So you can see, essentially, that um, where the attack clearly is taking place is when the, the amount of time it takes to do the attestation goes way up. And the important thing here is that even though the computers are at different hop counts from the server, uh, we can still establish a clear boundary for what is an acceptable timing limit for the self-attestation. So even the computer that's nine hops away versus one hop away, we can still just have one uniform limit for this is what delta T should be on our self-attestation. So that's important for practical purposes. Um, some other things that we found out were just, you know, things that were a result of actually trying to do this on real hardware and real operating systems was we had these little outlier values that you can see in the graph um, way down low at the bottom there. That's probably evidence that we're not implementing our self check some like uh, absolutely optimally. Um, and honestly, as Zeno was mentioning, most academics will say, well, we did guess and test or we hand coded our assembly, so obviously it's maximally, op maximally optimized. But the reality is to have a maximally optimized self checking algorithm, we would really need cooperation with the Intel engineers because they understand the Intel pipeline, which is very complicated, better than anyone. So if there's any Intel people in the audience, please come talk to us because we want to actually make our algorithm. Uh, as optimal as possible. Uh, and then there's some high outliers as well, and this is 
possibly just the attacker getting unlucky with um, the cash and things like that. So there still are some mysteries that remain to be solved in doing this. Um, so, right, we can use a single bound for all of our network data. This is very good for practical purposes. Uh, we can put computers all over our network and just have one delta T4. The self-attestation should take this long. If it does and the measurement's good, then I assume that this computer is trustworthy. I'm, I'm establishing trust with it over nine, ten hops, et cetera. Okay. Um, Despite all that, self-attestation is great, time-based attestation is great. Time of check, time of use attacks are still a big, big problem. Uh, the academics essentially write this off by saying, we have established code integrity. If my code runs unmolested, then I have won. If my code runs without any hooks in it, without any badness in it, but I still fail to detect the attacker, that is because my measurement was not good enough. I didn't measure all the places where the attacker could possibly be living, so this isn't a problem with self-attestation. It is a problem with our measurement scheme. Um, from a practical standpoint, this is kind of ridiculous because there's no way on an enterprise-grade operating system like Windows you could go out and search for all the possible places that the malware could be temporarily li living before it jumps back onto your code. So uh, in reality, we do need to keep trying to solve this problem or else the attacker is just going to keep waiting for the, um, the measurement to start, get out of the way, and then jump back in and infect our code once the measurement's over. So this is a, a big deal that we need to solve. Um, another uh, point that we, we kind of don't really think are good legs to stand on is that a lot of other academic work writes off this, this attack by saying, well, our attestation agent lives in the kernel, so no one can get to us because we're only measuring user land applications, or our measurement agent lives in the hypervisor or in system management mode, and these are protected modes of execution that can't be infected. Uh, well, you know, the history of security is essentially the history of access controls being defeated, so we don't only want to rely on access controls between these different privilege levels to protect us. We want to be able to exist at the same privilege level as the attacker. Um, so, you know, SMM is a commonly cited one. We live in SMM and no one else can get in SMM. And just to sort of combat that, that point, we have found vulnerabilities to get into SMM in the BIOS on the latest systems. Uh, we found several vulnerabilities that let us get into the BIOS even on the latest UEFI systems uh, that we'll be talking about later this year. So the point is, it isn't that impossible to get into the system management mode and the hypervisor, et cetera. So you can't just say, I'm in the hypervisor and no one else should get there. We really need to have more robust defensive systems. So um, some work we presented at CCS and Black Hat this year was basically evaluating trusted computing uh, with a trusted platform module and its static root of trust for measurement with the platform from configuration registers and so forth. And we found that this was totally insufficient and completely subvertible. Uh, if you're relying on your PCR values to know whether your system is infected or not, um, it's not good enough. You can fake out the TPM. So knowing that the TPM was, the TPM-based static root of trust for measurement was insufficient because if an attacker can get into the BIOS, which they can with exploits, they can totally fake out your TPM. We wanted to build a better root of trust for measurement that lives in the BIOS and system management mode. And to do that, we employed timing-based attestation living in system management mode to um, provide more trustworthy measurements of the system. And you can read more about that in the CCS paper or, or in the Black Hat presentation. Um, but that all seemed to work pretty good, uh, except for this problem, which Zeno already pointed out. Um, there's a, kind of a widely known problem in the industry where TPMs don't really implement the specification that the Trusted Computing Group provides very well. In fact, most of them do it very poorly. Uh, so for instance, these STMicro TPMs were all exhibiting different timing characteristics. That's kind of hard to deal with. Each system would have to have an individual baseline. Okay. Um, but for whatever reason, Broadcom TPMs, which we had in our Delhi 6400s that we got most of our data from, uh, did exhibit more sane timing characteristics. So you can see on the left, we're using the, the trusted platform module as a, a trusted stopwatch to time our BIOS and SMM measurements. So on the left is with the attack isn't taking that long. Then um, after we install an attack and we try to subvert our new system management mode, root of trust for measurement, the, uh, the time it takes the delta T is recorded by the trusted platform module is higher. In this case, there is some overlap. 
But if we increase the number of iterations of our sole checksum, this gets large enough to be distinguishable at the trade-off of our boot time taking longer. So uh, one thing that's important to emphasize here is that you know, vendors want their systems, their laptops to boot up faster and faster and faster. And the penalty you incur here is that as you increase the number of iterations, your boot up time is going to be longer because we're having to do this uh, BIOS chronomancy self-measurement and system management mode when we turn our computer on every time our platform uh, starts up. So you'd be adding one or two seconds into your boot time. So that, that is the, uh, the consequence there. Okay, I'm going to finish up. Right, so, so we're just, you know, we're showing that we're just doing a few uh, different variants on this existing thing. There's been a lot of different architectures that this has been applied to. You know, we see a, a lot of work in SCADA systems and things like that right now, but the expectation will be they're going to do the same thing that people have always done. They're going to lock the SCADA system down. They're going to say, I slapped some access controls on that. No one's ever going to get past them. We're good, we're done, right? And we know that's not going to work. That hasn't ever worked, really. So um, we think it's important that people understand that there are these types of techniques that are available, you know, and it's been applied to a bunch of different architectures. It's been uh, shown to work a number of different places. You know, you can, you can take the academic papers with a grain of salt and you should outright dismiss any papers that didn't actually implement their own results. But, um, but yeah, it's, it, we think it's basically a, a cool technique um, we're working on uh, it, dealing with uh, the talk to tax and stuff like that, but at the end of the day, you know, the reason we think something like this is sexy is because we're sitting there, we're writing, you know, hand-coded assembly, we're trying to uh, defeat attackers that we know are at the same privilege level, we're doing the back and forth of, you know, I'll write a timing-based attestation system, he'll write the attack for it, and then I'll have to come back and compensate for it. So there's this active engagement of, you know, actually make the attacks better, make the, the system better, and, and it's all, you know, there's still these hard problems that are left to be solved, but, um, but it's basically, you know, pretty rewarding in terms of actually having this very cool system that utilizes deep understanding of the way that the computers actually work. And, you know, that's, in the end of the day, that's what a lot of, uh, a lot of what makes attacks cool. It's saying, I understand this stuff better than you, I win, right? So that's kind of what we're going for here. All right, so um, just, you know, closing thoughts. Basically, uh, as I said, we did make our timing-based attestation system open source. The, um, it's not the full measurement system. It's not like the full measurement of the Windows kernel and things like that. That was uh, something else. But the core, like uh, the original Windows XP-based one, you can use this code, you can compile it, and you can have a full client-server system so that you can request a measurement and, uh, and get back uh, a, uh, a verified thing, and you'll see it takes a certain amount of time. Now, if you go out and do this on a VM or something like that, uh, don't be surprised if the timing is all crazy. This is a system that's meant to be run on hardware, right? Certain hardware takes a certain amount of time. So, but, uh, but it's pretty easy to, to get started with this. You can see what we're actually talking about when we're talking about this code. You can go in, you can look at the core self-attestation algorithm. It's you know, a bunch of macros that are just macros of assembly. You put the combination of assembly together, you have on the order of, I would say, maybe something like 60 instructions is the core one loop of the self-checksum. So we're talking 60 instructions. We also included the attack, our reference attack that we used in the paper. So literally, it's like a toggle. You send a message to the client, and it enables the attack. The attack starts forging the self-checksums, but it incurs extra time. And you can see our attack will, you know, I think it had on the order of maybe uh, nine instructions or something like that, because this whole incorporation of instruction pointer and data pointer leads to attacker complications, where when they add one instruction, it's not just the timing overhead. They've now, like, skewed the instruction pointer, and so then they have to compensate for that, which leads to more instructions and so forth. So you can check out the full attack, you can f check out the full uh, work, and basically, you know, go out and break it, see if you can uh, do better than us, make a more optimized algorithm, apply better knowledge of caching architectures and stuff like that. Um, and, and we do have right now the BIOS component as well, just so you can see what code was used. We don't have the full, like, custom BIOS put up there because uh, we're not clear on the legality of releasing things that are, you know, technically Dell's stuff that we technically reverse engineered and stuff like that. So, um, so the code that we used is there, but not like the full system is there. 
Um, and then also, you know, if you just want to start experimenting with TPMs and just understand like what they're doing, um, Corey released some tools that let you have a nice, easy way to just do things like, you know, get a timing measurement or get to the platform configuration uh, registers and so forth. And furthermore, you know, you've uh, you've already missed me talking about all my open security training classes, but but the trainer exchange, um, that sort of thing. A lot of those classes that are on that site are things that were directly benefiting sort of our research work. So the reason there's rootkits classes is because we had this anti-rootkit kernel mode research work. Uh, the reason we have a TPM class there is because, you know, Corey became an expert on TPMs, Ariel Segal knows the protocols, and, uh, and basically we have people who are doing experimentation with it. So you can kind of get bootstrapped on this low-level hardware things. You can get bootstrapped on the assembly code that's necessary to understand these full systems uh, with the material that we have up there. But, um, but thanks for attending, and, uh, and we'll take any questions that you have now. He's asking if we compensated for temp uh, if they compensated for temperature on the embedded systems. And the answer is, I don't believe I saw temperature referenced, no. Was there someone else question? Yes. Does it, does it matter if the attacker can push back in time for the first measurement? He's asking in the BIOS chronomancy system, does it matter if the attacker can sort of delay the first measurement? So he's going to like fix up a bunch of stuff and then he's going to delay the first measurement and run start the protocol later, essentially. And the answer for that is actually, um, it depends. So there's an element that we didn't actually mention for the TPM-based attestation system that's kind of cool that we'd like to use, but this is one of those problems where the TPM differing in their specifications matters. Down here for this baseline, we can say it takes you know, a certain amount of time, right? This is the delta T, this is the number of ticks that it actually takes. But when we're looking at sort of the protocol level, if I can find it here quick, let me go out quick. At the protocol level, you could actually set constraints and say the, t the first BIOS chronomancy measurement must start no later than ticks, tick, TPM tick number 100 or something like that. So you could enforce that the protocol has to actually start uh, early in the system. How it would matter is basically if the thing was actually running much later, you would expect that there's potentially a talk to attack in, in practice. So basically picture an attacker who right here between when he gets the nonce and when he starts the protocol, he's off there like cleaning everything up and then he lets the thing run and then he gets control after it's run and then he dirties everything up again, right? So that would be a talk to attack and as we've sort of said, the talk to attacks are an outstanding issue we think in certain TPMs, we can deal with it with uh, constraints on the literal tick stamp value, like it must be this early. But the problem is different TPMs, like some of them, when you power reset, they don't actually reset the tick count. And there's just weirdness. Like each of the three main TPMs we have in our environment, they all behave differently. So I think there was one that we thought might work, but not sure. Other questions?